This session is going to be moderated by Jennifer McKinney. Jennifer holds a dual appointment at UCLA Anderson School of Management and the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine's Department of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonology and Critical Care. She's the co-executive director of UCLA Biodesign, a new joint interdisciplinary initiative that's led by UCLA Health, the David Geffen School of Medicine, and UCLA Anderson that promotes leadership and entrepreneurship in healthcare technology. Uh, Jennifer, let me turn it over to you and, uh, and welcome. Thank you, Terry, and thank you to our previous panelists for that wonderful discussion. I'm really excited about our discussion today, which will be focused around technology and healthcare. And we have two fantastic panelists on the, on the line to join us today. You know, healthcare has never been more critical to our society, our infrastructure, and our economy. Um, in reflection, our nation continues to face the challenges and suffering of what, what I would really say is a double pandemic, double pandemic, one of systemic racism that has been you know, long under addressed, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's very clear that science, technology, and medicine are fundamental to our success moving forward as a, a society and, and a, a nation. So it, it's really my pleasure to welcome our, our two esteemed panelists, Todd Park and Dr. James Maltz or Jim, as, as I have now know that he likes to go by. So thank you, Todd and Jim, for joining us. I'd like to give you um, a chance to introduce yourselves on the panel. Uh, it tells a little bit about your journey. Um, but prior to doing that, I would just want to stress kind of three key themes. If you know Terry Kramer, he likes themes for discussion. And so I think our three key themes for today's discussion are really around data and technology, how are they driving the transformation of healthcare? And then finally, a theme that I'd like to explore is what's the role of the tech stack? It's been so successful and Uber and Netflix and other areas. And I think we have two fantastic examples of entrepreneurs that are driving the development of a robust tech stack in a healthcare setting. So Todd, I'll turn it over to you for, to introduce yourself and welcome you to the panel. Thanks so much. It's a, a great honor and pleasure to be here today. Uh, and I'll just be super brief because I really want to hear Jim's, <laughs> Jim's intro. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Todd Park. Um, I'm a, a healthcare and tech entrepreneur. Uh, my background, uh, really professionally, that's relevant, is uh, when I was 24 and didn't know better uh, with my brother, Ed Park, uh, and my best friend, they started a company called Athena Health, whose mission was to dramatically improve maternity care, starting with the indigent. Um, actually, we got started in, in, in San Diego, California. Um, and uh, making incredible long story short, uh, we ended up building the first cloud-based software to run doctor's offices um, and integrated back office services attached to that software, and the company just took off. Um, and Athena Health uh, serving uh, 100,000 uh, doctors' offices today and uh, helping them be the best they can possibly be. Um, I also uh, co-founded a company called Castlight Health, uh, which is basically a, a, an online health benefits management platform and a shopping service, which was mostly built by other people uh, because about a year and a half into Castlight, uh, while still being on the board of Athena, um, I got drafted very unexpectedly by the United States federal government, uh, which is not typically uh, the thing that an entrepreneur thinks they're gonna go do. Uh, but uh, this country has given me and my family everything uh, as an immigrant family. And so when my, when my country asked me to serve, I said, of course, I will do that. And uh, my wife and I signed up for a year-long tour of duty that became seven years. <laughs> and it was an unbelievable adventure, an extraordinary experience. Uh, that was just massively, massively uh, meaningful and an incredible honor uh, to, 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 to be helpful to, to this country that I love so deeply and profoundly. Then uh, at the end of President Obama's uh, a second term, um, I ended my tour of duty, public service, um, and uh, reunited with my brother, Ed Park, uh, who stepped down from being chief operating officer of Athena. And we started a company called Devoted Health, which I'll talk more about today, uh, whose mission is to dramatically improve health and well-being of seniors by caring for each and every person like they're our own family. Um, and it's an incredible honor to, to be here today. Uh, and I really want to hear Jim's intro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jim, if that's your cue. I guess so. So thank you. And and Todd, I, I'm I'm the biggest fan. Uh, you and your brother and and Athena will will talk about my journey. But uh, along the way, I've I've actually uh, had many interactions uh, uh, with with uh, your your brother's colleagues and and Jonathan along the way. And and Athena is really the from the beginning, the the template for the pioneer in cloud-based digital health. Uh, for me, this journey started uh, as a kid in a, in a dream to become a, a, a heart surgeon someday, uh, starting in junior high school. 
and uh, went to college. Uh, unfortunately, my father died on my first day of college, so I had to get a job. And the job I got was uh, just uh, uh, fortuitously uh, working for a a monumental surgeon entrepreneur, uh, well known of the 20th century. Uh, one of his devices is actually in the Smithsonian Institution. So he inspired me, and I was a technician in the, in the intensive care unit at 18 years old, just, just fascinated by all the bedside monitors and all the data and, and the information that's used in order to take care of people and make life and death decisions. And so I was hooked, uh, uh, went to medical school and, and uh, did my surgical residency at Duke, but, but I've, I've been a, a uh, technology geek, uh, you know, from from the very beginning and really fascinated with the notion of, you know, and I became a lung transplant surgeon. Uh, and in that conundrum, as I said, we have all this rich data at the bedside and in the intensive care unit and in the operating room. And then five days after you do a lung transplant, you send this person home and you have, you go from all this rich data to literally nothing. And, and it's just hard to take care of somebody with no information. And so for the past 20 years of my career, I, I transitioned to building out technology companies, uh, really that are driven not just on the, the medical device itself, but the, the data and the information uh, that emanates from those, those technologies. And, and one of those uh, companies uh, ended up uh, in a transaction with Microsoft, and I had the pleasure of helping build the first healthcare division at Microsoft uh, under Peter Newpert and, and create something called Health Vault, uh, which like Athena was, was really the early pioneer of, of a cloud-based electronic health record. And boy, did we learn a lot uh, about uh, trying to extract data out of these institutions who were very possessive of what they thought was data that they owned and controlled. And, uh, you know, and, then, and then all of the concern about people storing their data in the cloud, uh, which was a very early concept in 2006. So a lot of tremendous learnings. Uh, started another company out of Microsoft uh, called Healthy Circles. And, uh, and for, for better or worse, uh, that system was immediately adopted in a previous global pandemic for H1N1. And so we were working with the Obama administration in 2009. And, and I think we may have had some meetings or interactions together because we built the nationwide platform with the American Medical Association to be able to track uh, coughs and fevers and, and symptoms of, of H1N1 at the time. And uh, that company ended up getting acquired into a little known company called Qualcomm. And, uh, and for the last uh, subsequent five years, I was the chief medical officer of health Qualcomm's division. That was really, it was a great succession because once we all started getting comfortable with cloud-based electronic records, then we could start think about thinking about how do we get the the medical device data uh, out of the blood pressure meter and the glucose meter up into that same cloud, and then be able to do remote patient monitoring uh, it, out of the home. And the whole notion of virtual care. Uh, when I left Qualcomm in 2018, it, it's uh, I kind of had enough scars and bruises to think about the grand finale and uh, created a company called BioIntelliSense, uh, which we think is, is pretty close to uh, solving the, the final challenges that will allow remote patient monitoring to be something that is truly ubiquitous. Uh, what we wanna do and, and, and for better words, we'll talk about this. COVID has been a tremendous forcing function for, for health systems, doctors, nurses, hospitals to, to make the leap to virtual care 
and we're you know out of sheer necessity a lot of care over the past year has had no choice but to be delivered virtually and i'm not talking about covid patients i'm talking about everything else and and now we're seeing oh my gosh this can be easy it can be safe and effective and actually people like it more <laughs> it's more convenient and so now that virtual care is upon us and i think it's irreversible what we've done is created the the simple technologies that will allow us to capture the vital signs data and and the the medical data that we need from someone at home uh, without dragging them to the hospital, without dragging them to the clinic, and be able to say, wow, now we can truly eliminate these artificial boundaries of being in the hospital or out of the hospital. We can just take care of you wherever is appropriate. And uh, so it's a really exciting time. This is a perfect forum to, to talk about what this is going to look like, because now undeniably five years from now most certainly 10 years from now we have have truly entered into the tipping point and we're going to be looking back and saying wow i i i i can't imagine the you know practicing medicine or delivering care the way we did uh you know 10 years ago or even five years ago it's it's uh it's forever changed and it's a great thing. It will help us address disparities of care very, very clearly. We should talk about that and access to care and the economics of care and the, the beneficial outcomes. So thrilled to be a part of this uh, conversation, especially with Todd, uh, who I've uh, had such admiration for uh, all of your contributions and dedication. Right back at you. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Jim. And, you know, I think it's no coincidence that you two have crossed paths before, certainly. And, uh, yeah, Jim, you brought up so many great points, and I kind of want to put a pin in some of those. And one that I think is so so relevant is this idea of, of virtual care, because I think that's a lot of what Todd is using in tandem with technology and the, how he's building this tech stack at Devoted. So, Todd, this is a part question, because I know we had this fantastic overview of Medicare Advantage. We had Sachin Jane speak last night, CEO of Scan Health. So I think our audience is, is familiar with that model. Can you tell me why one Medicare Advantage is such a hot space right now? We've got Clover, we've got uh, you know, Oscar, there's a, there's a ton of people on health insure tech. So what role is our technology and virtual care playing in this market that you find yourself in? Sure. Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, um, so most fundamentally, I think uh, for the purposes of this discussion, Medicare Advantage is a phenomenal foundation uh, upon which to execute on value-based payment and care. Um, and I would define you know, value-based care as the right care, including very importantly, non-clinical support, delivered in the right place at the right time, uh, that both significantly improves outcomes and also significantly reduces cost. Uh, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, because when you have someone with diabetes or hypertension or congestive heart failure, if you give them fantastic, proactive, highly coordinated, consistent, right, carry place, right time, right? You, you both keep them as well as possible. And you also prevent them from having to go to the hospital multiple times, right? Um, so uh, Medicare Advantage is a wonderful foundation for this because uh, if you build a Medicare Advantage plan and you build uh, slash partner with providers, um, that are connected to your medical management plan, um, what you do is you sign up a set of seniors, right, as Sachin has explained, I'm sure, and uh, the federal government validates that those seniors have signed up for your medical management plan, and the federal government says, okay, you are now Medicare, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay you a, uh, effectively a health insurance premium at the first of every month uh, from the United States of America <laughs> that is equal to what Medicare thinks it would have paid, basically, uh, if that senior had stayed on Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare, um, which is actually a really high amount, uh, unfortunately for America, <laughs> because what Medicare is paying for today is a uh, generally disorganized, fragmented, uncoordinated, incentive misaligned, information poor, reactive 
healthcare system that is just empirically terrible at getting people the right care in the right place at the right time. Uh, and therefore uh, has way too many hospitalizations and way too, way too many medication errors and way too many uh, um, preventable adverse events, avoidable deaths, et cetera. So, um, so that, that becomes your premium. Um, and the good news, right, is that you can then actually innovate based on having that payment to deliver dramatically better care, value-based care, um, supported by value-based payment methodologies, uh, such that uh, you and your provider partners um, and the providers that you've built, right, a combination of all the above, get people the right care, right place, right time in a proactive coordinated way, uh, which then actually saves a lot of money um, versus, the, versus the, the, the premium, which you then can actually uh, reinvest uh, in better and better and better care and ultimately return savings to America <laughs> by slowing down the rate of healthcare cost growth, which is of existential importance to the United States because if healthcare costs keep growing at their historical rates, I mean, it'll eventually consume like all of the money we have, uh, uh, which is not a sustainable situation, right? Um, and I think it, it, the, the key to all of this to understand, right, is that uh, as Atul Gawande says, right, the best care in the world the best care in the world, the kind of care you'd want for your mom and dad, the right care in the right place at the right time, right, actually costs a lot less money than what America is spending per capita today. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be hard. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in that context, uh, you know, virtual care is a revolution, is a revolution, right? And this is something that uh, my company devoted is uh, making incredibly heavy use of, right? And I totally agree uh, with, uh, with Dr. Jim um, in that COVID uh, has been a huge accelerator because by necessity, uh, you know, virtual care has had to move to fill the gap. And simultaneously, uh, you know, certainly the senior population, there's been a sea change in seniors' willingness to accept telehealth services. Um, and if you combine advances in remote patient monitoring with telehealth, video visits, et cetera, right? You, uh, you know, I mean, look, right care, right place, right time, right? In that pattern, it's increasingly obvious that the right place <laughs> much of the time is in fact the home. <laughs> um, and as James can, uh, can cite chapter and verse, right? I mean, it's not just about uh, being able to do virtually what you could do in person before. It's about doing it dramatically better. Right. So if, if, for example, you look at the typical pattern of how a chronic illness is managed. Right. And look, badly managed uh, hypertension, you know, diabetes, you know, other chronic illness. Right. It's it's the biggest driver of more serious, really serious, problematical events like heart attacks and strokes and vascular disease and kidney disease and, you know, and so on and so forth. Right. So you really want to manage hypertension uh, and uh, diabetes, et cetera. Right. Really, really well. Um, you know, the way that that's happened historically for most people is like you go to the doctor and doctor takes a measurement, is very concerned, and then gives you some drugs and says, please exercise and try to eat better and I'll see you in 90 days. And you come back in 90 days, right? Doctor takes a measurement, still super worried, says I'm going to adjust your medications <laughs> and please try to eat better and exercise. Come back in 90 days, right? It takes months or even years, right, to get that condition right under control. Um, whereas in the world that, that you know, uh, Jim has pioneered, <laughs> right, if you have someone with a continuous glucose monitor, right, or a wireless blood pressure cuff or a wireless scale, and that's streaming data to you into software, which can parse it, right, and it's connected to a virtual care team, multidisciplinary, and you can actually literally see results in real time, you can actually uh, uh, iterate uh, what you do for that patient and provide coaching for that patient on a cycle time that's like within like, <laughs> it's like the next day, right? I change your meds. The next day after that, I change your meds, right? I'm giving you coaching because I see something happening. And so something must have happened there where I should talk to you about diet or whatever, right? Um, and so you can literally bring someone under control within like one to two weeks, right? Versus actually <laughs> months or Six years. Months. Because, because of the power right, of having rich real-time data and then the ability to dramatically shorten the cycle of do something, see what happens, 
adjust. Um, so it's not just, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one replacement, right? A physical care being replaced with virtual care, right? It, it, it's actually a dramatic <laughs> improvement in the underlying care. And, and, and it's so obvious and it's so powerful that it almost makes you angry, right? That America hasn't done this a long <laughs> time ago, right? But as, as Churchill said, uh, uh, you know, uh, America can always be relied upon to do the right thing after it's exhausted every available alternative. Uh, <laughs> And I get to see that because I'm an incredibly proud American uh, um, that will ferociously defend this country, right? Um, uh, but one of the things I love about the country is that, you know, we're very self-critical um, and eventually we end up doing the right thing. <laughs> and I think that's actually finally happening in healthcare. Thank, thank you, John. You know, I appreciate the, the one, one, your service, of course, but then two, also the analogy that you made in terms of technology advancing both the chronic care patient and then the example that Jim gave earlier about the acute patient, the lung or heart transplant patient who you just don't want to send home after five days. And I think my question to you, Jim, is based on all of this, are we going to see a reverse of the technology flow, right? So we're pushing the lesson base of technology to the home. At what point do we bring the lesson base of technologies back into the hospital? At what point are they wearing a bio sticker, which I believe goes on the chat, are they wearing that in the OR? Like how far are we away from the technology to be able to reverse that cycle and bring the technology back in that is less invasive, that is, you know, like the daily newspaper, as Todd alluded to? Well, the good news is it's imminent. And uh, again, as a forcing function, COVID has put health systems, hospitals in particular, in, in a horrible scenario where they've they've run out of ICU beds they've, they're they're at capacity e even right now today I can't name it but there are some hospitals on the east coast that have COVID patients in the hallways and they don't have enough nurses to even check on them and uh, and so we're being uh, utilized to be able to put put bio stickers on patients in the hospital and be able to have this centralized monitoring, basically an air traffic control system that will allow one nurse case manager to have a dashboard and be able to literally see like an air traffic control uh, uh, manager, what patients are green and doing fine and what patients are yellow and which ones are red and be able to smartly allocate the the time and attention of a set of limited resources. And then further scenarios where, okay, this patient is starting to get better. Um, we're gonna put a sticker on them and be able to have a, a, a good confirmation of their stability. And you know what? We would normally keep them another day or two, but we can't let's send them home and we'll just start monitoring from home and it'll open a bed so we can take a, a, an admission of somebody that's, that's sicker and needs that bed. And then separately, independent of COVID, we now have health systems, some very large ones in the next month that are going to start putting stickers on everyone at the time of admission. And they said, we're now convinced that by having this continuous streaming data and this air traffic control system that we can better manage nurse workflow and resources and, and be able to just sort of like a glide path of, of again, the, the, the uh, airline uh, analogy of being able to, from the time somebody comes in, be able to track them throughout their hospitalization and then put them on a glide, glide path and know when's the perfect ideal time to be able to just send them home and let them have a soft landing in their own bed. Uh, and, and as Todd said, this is not incremental. This is paradigm shift. And we're talking about, and I can show you some of the economics uh, on, on, on even a slide. We're talking about a, about a 25 fold uh, improvement in, in efficiencies and outcomes. And, I, and, and there's, it's really a shift in, in what historically, and I'm talking 2000 years of the practice of medicine. For 2000 years in the practice of medicine, uh, if you were sick, you would see the, you would go to the doctor and the doctor would see you examine you, 
make their best guess at what's wrong, uh, give you a treatment and send you off. And then who knows if it worked or not. Uh, if we see you again, you probably lived. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if we didn't see you again, we don't know. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. Uh, but now that, that episodic model of care it is suddenly no longer um, tenable. It's not going to be justifiable because now we have the technology, the understanding, the wherewithal to, to deliver care in what we call a continuous care model. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's not uh, relegated to a fixed facility and it's not relegated to a moment in time. It's a continuum. And we have, as Todd said, the ability to, to be able to manage somebody's hypertension in, over a matter of, of literally weeks and optimize their therapy and ensure that their, their blood pressure is now well controlled. Uh, instead of seeing them in a clinic, putting them on a medication, and then giving them an appointment to come back in six months and we'll see how it went. You know, in that six month time, if that medication didn't work, some of those people had a hypertensive crisis and ended up in the emergency room for five or $10,000. And sadly, one or two of them may have even had a major stroke event, which you know, is a horrific tragedy and costs the healthcare system $100,000. Uh, so this is really, really uh, an exciting time, and uh, you know, again, we're 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 aligning all of the incentives. So the the perverse incentives of the past under fee for service uh, will will fade into the into into the memory, and and with aligned incentives, virtual care, remote patient monitoring, we can truly get to the ability to deliver far better care to vastly more people at a fraction of the cost. Thanks, Jim. And you know, I think that's a great segue as we think about how do we, what are the underpinnings of all this for the second part of the discussion today is really around the complexities of launching a business in the healthcare or health tech step sector. And you know, data is really a linchpin of a lot of what we're talking about here. And so I'd love to you know, just kind of switch gears a little bit and think about, you know, Todd, for you, from your perspective, what are the key data variables? What are the key sources that you're bringing in as you look at an individual devoted member? And I love the analogy you use, but you know, you treat your, your members are like family members. How, what kind of care would you want them to have? So how do you pull this data together? How is technology enabling you to efficiently use this data from an biointelligence, biointelligence monitor or other technologies that you're using in your, in your plan? Absolutely. Um, so, um, so in our case, uh, we've actually simplified the problem quite substantially uh, because we're what's called a tech-enabled payvidor. Um, so we uh, uh, have you know custom built a, a multi-layer stack of capability uh, that includes our, our our very own health plan that's optimized for execution of value-based payment and care, um, our very own software platform that runs our health plan and all of our care services. Uh, we partner very closely uh, with top healthcare providers, um, uh, including uh, uh, a very carefully selected cadre of primary care physicians uh, who are our uh, close partners with whom we share joint financial and clinical accountability um, for, for all work and all care. Um, and then we have a, a built-in, uh, we call devoted health guide service that each of our members gets. That's basically their, their, their tech-enabled guardian angel service, or I call it basically tech-enabled professional daughter and son service. If your daughter and son happen to be a health plan service expert, a social worker, a nurse, and a pharmacist, again, operating on our software, um, uh, that gives them uh, omniscience into the situation of a member and, and what needs to happen to a member um, in order for them to get the right care replaced right time. Uh, and we have our own medical group as well, our own built-in uh, house call virtual care group um, that can complement our primary care doctor partners uh, and project clinical power into the home on a continuous basis, um, as Dr. Jim was talking about, which is just a, a just a, a complete sea change versus kind of the episodic style of care, right? That has historically predominated. So we combine all of that into one service, uh, maniacally focused on getting everyone the kind of care you want for your mom and dad, 
right care plus right time. And, and as you probably have inferred <laughs> from what I just said, we have internally basically a massive amount of data um, that we then can use to get people the right care plus right time, right? Because we are the payer. So we know all the services you have, right? We know all your prescriptions, right? You know, we uh, 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 you know, work very closely with provider partners that want to collaborate with us to take fantastic care of people. Um, you know, we have Guide, uh, which is a continuous source of not just clinical info, but very important non-clinical info um, about you and your living circumstances, what's going on with your life, right? And we've got our own house call slash virtual medical group that's delivering care to you directly. So we have an enormous amount of data. And, and very importantly, um, we collect all that data in an apples to apples real time way in our own custom built software platform, which then parses it, um, uh, analyzes it, you know, uh, and, uh, and then tees up what's going on at what needs to happen and facilitates uh, what happens next. Um, so that, 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 um, that, that, so that, that, that just gives us a huge advantage, right? Because, um, we know what the heck is going on <laughs> and we know it in a time frame that is relevant <clears throat> where we actually do something about it. Right. Um, and that honestly is a huge part of the battle in healthcare is having, uh, information omniscience, uh, with ever richer information critically in a timely way, right? As a primary doctor partner say, it does me no good to learn that my patient was admitted to the hospital two weeks ago. <laughs> That's completely useless to me, right? I need to know like right now, right? Um, and uh, it, 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 it does me no good. It does us and our primary doctor is no good to understand that someone has reached a point of criticality in their chronic condition that leads them to need to be in the hospital right now. Right. Um, and so it, it is, it, it's really, really important to get information, the right information in a really timely way so you can do something. Um, and devoted, one way to think about devoted is that, you know, we're a object that is built to enable that kind of real time information omniscience. Um, and here, here's the other thing, you know, and this is kind of bad news, good news, right? I mean, <laughs> um, you know, we will ultimately make extensive use of ML and AI, right? Uh, but American healthcare problems are so bad and the holes in patient care are so big that once you actually accumulate comprehensive data, even highly imperfect data, you can see the holes from space. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you can see them from space. And so it's very obvious what to do. <laughs> and then, you know, I like to joke that basically by the time we really need ML and AI to figure out what to do next, like we'll have already like <laughs> saved a gajillion lives and cut the cost of American healthcare by like 25%, because we'll have done the super obvious stuff. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, there, there's more There's more to get at. And so we're very excited about using MLAI to get to the next level of finding things to do. But right now, if you just assemble a pretty basic picture in real time, right, of a patient's comprehensive situation, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's really obvious what to do. Uh, and then and then you just gotta have a lever to go do those things. Yeah, Todd, I appreciate the, the thought about kind of what are the things that we can do today and what are the things that we can do tomorrow? And there's a lot of things that we can just be doing today with what we have versus waiting for technology in the future. I have a follow-up to you, Jim, about, about this concept of data. I just want to be mindful that, you know, health insurance is a very capital intensive business. So when you're thinking about starting a health insurance business, and certainly you, you know, you raised about 300 million two years ago, how do you do you see a, a host of other follow-on companies getting into this space? How do you start this kind of business when it's so capital intensive? Are there only a few um, or can there be many? Are you asking me? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I guess you, you, you asked Jim. I said, oh, Jim started one too? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, have different, I have a different tough question for Jim coming up. <laughs> yeah, no, so, um, so look, I mean, you know, um, uh, 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 Basically, Ed and I um, uh, set out when starting Devoted, right, to build what we thought was the uh, smallest possible object <laughs> um, that could deliver on the mission of scalably getting to everyone that kind of carried mom for your mom and dad. Um, and uh, smallest possible because, like, the more you take on, right, the harder and harder it is, right? We ended up with the smallest possible object being this tech enabled pay by bar <laughs> uh, where we have to build our own health plan and build our own software platform and build our own partnerships with doctors 
and build our own health guide service and build our own house called Merchant Medical Group because that was the smallest possible object that we thought could guarantee that we could actually get each and every person right care place right time and be able to scale it uh, without being at the mercy of forces outside of our control. Um, uh, so that, that's how we thought about it. Um, you know, it, it's basically an alternate universe American healthcare system. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's been, it's been called the incredibly obvious play that no one's done yet because it's so hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we feel very fortunate, right, that, that we have access to the capital um, and uh, you know, not just the, 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 the financial capital, right, but the, the, the human capital, the experiential capital, the relationship capital, um, the temporal capital. We have founder control, right, so we can give our company like a long-term time horizon, which you absolutely need to take on this kind of play. Um, so we feel very fortunate that we get to, we get to basically run this play. You know, um, uh, um, and you know, it, 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 it's 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 really hard, right? You know, but if you can execute, it, it definitely works. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> um, and things are going 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 uh, very well for us. Knock on wood. Um, it doesn't mean that's the only way, right? Um, it just means that with other ways, you just have to be cognizant of what you're at the mercy of, right? So if you don't control the payer layer then you have to deal with current payers um, and what they decide to pay for and what they don't decide to pay for, whether they're acting on a 10-year time horizon or a quarter-long time horizon, <laughs> right? How innovative they are, um, how good their tech is, how liquid their data is, their ability to use data that's inbound, right? Their ability to craft new payment methodologies, their ability to think creatively and differently, right? And you know, I mean, and you have CEOs like Sachin Jane, right? Like I'm the president of the Sachin Jane fan club. Like I worship the ground Sachin Jane walks on, right? You know, I will tell you, he is an exceptional health plan CEO. They don't all think like that. <laughs> and so you may have to just resort, you, know, you may have to resign yourself to the fact that your TAM is Sa the Sachin Jane TAM. <laughs> and so you got to size that, right? You know, and see, see, you know, see how that, how that, how that fits with your business plan, right? And so, um, you know, uh, uh, and so you know, if you don't control the entire stack, you know, it's still possible to make a big difference. You, you just have to you just have to realize that you're at the mercy of the other layers of the stack. Um, now, I think the good news is that there is innovation happening at each layer of the stack at a differential speed. Um, and so I think America is making forward progress. Right. You know, uh, you know, uh, but different different layers are moving at different speeds different places, right? And so we just simplify the problem by saying, okay, we'll just be the whole stack <laughs> and just roll. Um, uh, 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 but you know, there are other ways. You, know, you, you just got to, in your, in your business plan, your product plan, your plan of attack, just account for what you don't control and how you actually kind of you know, plug into those other layers you don't control and what your battle plan is to actually have that work for you. Thanks, Todd. Jim, I think that lays the framework for the question for you around scaling, you know, an RPM business. And there are some questions in the chat kind of directed at that as well. How do you scale that? What is your data flow look like? And do you have a stack that's kind of driving your ability to scale as BioIntelligence begins the launch of, of several of the, the pilots that you mentioned? Yeah, it's it's definitely, I mean, healthcare is is complex and uh, you know, as as Todd, I think has uh, uh, already mastered. It's it's making sure that that you've got as many of the variables uh, under under your control as possible. And at the end of the day, the the one has the one who has the best flow of data and and intelligence about those patients uh, will likely. Uh, be able to take it most advantage of them in in identifying uh, developing problems, being able to act quickly in real time and do something about it before it becomes a, an, a, an expensive crisis, a trip to the emergency room, a rehospitalization, and and so you know when we talk about virtual care, I think it's really important for people to to understand the, the key distinction between telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Uh, so first, uh, telehealth is really being able to use 
what we're doing right now, uh, a, a Zoom meeting and, a, and, and an interaction uh, without having this to be physically in the same room, but to be able to converse, it, it basically what we call synchronous communication. We're all talking to each other at the same time. Uh, now, having said that, synchronous communication is still expensive when it comes to healthcare delivery. It still occupies the physical time of, of a healthcare professional to talk to that patient, uh, so be it over a, a, a webcam as a virtual visit. So when we make the distinction with remote patient monitoring, now what we're talking about is, is asynchronous data collection. In other words, we can have somebody with a medical device uh, and that, that device collecting data from that individual uh, and then transmitting that data to the healthcare professional where it can then be incorporated into what we call an exception management dashboard where algorithms, alerts and notifications and, and a rules logic are applied to that data flow and therefore allow uh, one clinician to be monitoring dozens, hundreds, potentially even thousands of patients simultaneously because uh, just like an air traffic control system, you have red, yellow, and green allocations and, and you don't have to spend time uh, of resources on those greens, you just have to focus on the reds. So uh, that preamble leads to what are the necessary requirements to make remote patient monitoring something that is truly ubiquitous? The first thing is it starts with an effortless patient experience. If you expect to give a patient a bunch of equipment and have them go home and hook all this stuff up and to figure out how to make these measurements on themselves in an active manner day after day or week after week, don't count on it, it won't happen. The, the, the burden of effort is simply too great. So the, the true secret to scalable, ubiquitous remote patient monitoring starts with what we call passive data monitoring. It's effortless on the part of the patient. And if you're able to get this rich data and insights about what's going on with someone, without uh, any burden on, on their effort or, or uh, participation and compliance, you're, you're going to win in, in being able to have that flow of data. Immediately after that, it's all about having medical grade accuracy. Um, for better or worse, we, we've had great experiences with the consumer wearables over the past 10 years. A lot of excitement that has really not borne out in, in the practice of medicine uh, because frankly, if you're going to make some important, uh, potentially life and death decisions on someone remotely that you're not even able to examine, that data has to be as good as the data that we make measurements in the clinic or in the hospital uh, Otherwise, I'm going to have to bring you into my clinic to, to make those measurements. So medical grade matters. It has to be real time, as Todd said earlier. And then as we talked about having uh, a rules logic, alerts and notifications, it doesn't have to be AI. It doesn't have to be machine learning. It's simply look at all these blood pressure measurements, apply a set of rules, and then show me which patients are having problems with their blood pressure. It's not as Todd said, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. And the last but not least is, is reimbursement for remote patient monitoring. And, and remarkably, it, it, it took uh, almost 10 years and, and uh, I can say it, I was involved in a lot of organizations and, and uh, uh, trade groups that help push forward uh, what's now approaching $30 billion of new reimbursement specifically for remote patient monitoring. And so this is really, uh, again, the, the moment where all the stars have aligned. 
with virtual care, with Medicare Advantage programs that are aligning the incentives uh, on the payer, the provider, and the patient, and then the technology to be able to deliver care in a, a completely new way uh, that's, that's, as we said, better, faster, and more cost-effective. Thanks, Jim. I think I'm going to bring us to the, the final part of our discussion. I sort of have um, two questions I want to ask, and, and we have a few questions in the chat I'd like to address. When we think about Todd, Devote is doing an excellent job in delivering very high quality care to many Medicare and Medicare Advantage members in the U.S. How do we use technology to expand that scope? And Sachin Chain talked a little bit about this last night, but to other populations, how do we think about a quality of care and access of care in light of data and technology? Totally. Um, so, um, uh, so just just speaking from from my perspective at Devoted, uh, you know, Devoted um, serves. Medicare today. Uh, we serve a dual eligibles people on Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, we plan to expand to Medicaid. We plan to expand to uh, then commercially insured people under 65. Um, uh, because the, 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 the model, right, the tech enabled pay provider model, um, uh, you know, uh, equipped with virtual care um, that uh, gives you the right care, right place, right time in a way that includes outcomes and cuts cost. Um, that, that's a model that's applicable across the entire U.S. healthcare system uh, and to all populations served. Um, and frankly, it's applicable beyond the United States as well. Um, and so I think seniors is just the most obvious place to start uh, because that's where the need is the greatest, um, at, where healthcare spending is the greatest, right? Where the waste because uh, care is suboptimal is the greatest. And so you start there. Uh, but then, you know, absolutely, right? You know, um, uh, you know we as a country should... Uh, should 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 move beyond that, <laughs> um, and, uh, and and go go population wide. Thanks, Todd. Looking to the the future, I want to talk a little about just horizons, exits for this space. A fantastic to hear about both of the work that you're that you're doing. You know, Jim, if I could ask you, we talked, you alluded to it earlier, but how COVID has accelerated the pace of technology adoption, technology transformation. I used to think of healthcare changes five to ten years in the future. Now it's two to three or three to five. They're so much more, they're more acute. They're in the short term. So looking at COVID, looking at what's happened, if you're looking at the landscape as a whole, what do you look at as sort of COVID positive, COVID neutral, COVID, COVID negative? What's your forecast for sort of the next two to three years in terms of the impact on, on this health tech sector? Well, I mean, this, as you know, is, is red hot. Uh, just in the past four weeks, there have been... Uh, three uh, major acquisitions, one by Phillips, one by Boston Scientific, and another one um, of Barty by, uh, uh, I'll have to remember, but uh, you know, the, the multiples of the American Wells and the Teladocs are, are uh, you know, uh, very uh, uh, impressive and, and, it, and it, for good reason, I think what we're seeing as a three trillion dollar industry that that uh, is is has the proof points uh, to be clear that that this is uh, now on the uh, the hockey stick of adoption and uh, and you know on my whiteboard next to me I have 27 uh, marquee name academic medical centers who definitively a year ago today had no program whatsoever in remote patient monitoring that that are all literally either already signed or on red lines to stand up a virtual care command center and remote patient monitoring capability with with telehealth and and it and it's really remarkable how quickly this is happening uh, realizing that they can sh suddenly reduce length of stay by a day, and all of that goes to their to their DRG uh, bottom line. Um, how they can reduce thirty day readmissions, and then the whole cadre of of chronic care management. So uh, I, I don't think there is any debate that the uh, the floodgates are are now open, um, and we're working very hard to to be able to, to, again, leverage technology 
to be able to generate the data. It's really a mistake to be to be enamored with the widgets and gadgets. Um, it really is all about the value creation that that is derived out of making this new rich data available in real time to, and, and, and yet you have to be careful because the data is gonna be overwhelming to clinicians. So clinicians don't want all this data. What they want is actionable information. And those are two really important different things. Uh, you know, we have uh, arguably a, an incredible uh, technology capability that's generating data that's that's quite unique right now, um, but we don't even uh, ascribe ourselves as a medical device company uh, with FDA clearance and everything. We are a data services company. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Jim, because it addresses one of the questions that are chat about what do physicians do with all this data? And you know, it's yeah. not just about the, they want the actionable data, not just the continuous data. Yeah. Uh, I want to take one of the questions in our, in our chat, uh, maybe for you, Todd. It's from Jim Best, one of our Anderson, Anderson alumni in the healthcare sector. And he asks, for the chronically ill, remote patient monitoring is critical, but how do we use the data to induce behavior with respect to sleep, diet, exercise, socialization? I think what Jim's really getting at is healthcare yeah. is a human, ba human business, right? So behavior change is essential to execute everything, you know, upstream of the tech, upstream and downstream of the tech stack, probably that you're building. How do you address that? 100%. So uh, 100% agree um, that you have to combine data tech uh, and service together, right, um, to deliver that an outcome. So, um, so in our uh, virtual chronic illness management programs, right, we, we do have devices that people have that do stream us data into software, uh, but uh, that's tied to a multidisciplinary approach, right? So you have a, an educator, a nutritionist, a social worker, a pharmacist, a nurse, a physician, right? Um, uh, who, uh, you know, powered in great part by the software um, are on top of that uh, patient um, and determining what to do uh, and then undertaking the right action at the right time uh, you know, which includes like real time coaching, uh, about, uh, about diet, uh, for example. Right. Um, and, uh, and it just, you know, just turns out that, you know, if you coach someone in real time, um, about diet based on what you think you're seeing in the data, um, and then follow up with them again and again and again in rapid order, that's dramatically more effective than saying to a person in the medical office, please try to eat better. And here's an elaborate plan for how to do it. And I'll check with you again in six months. <laughs> All right, so so yeah. just like it's, it's it's vastly more effective in terms of say adjusting a medication regimen to see the result of your change um, in real time, and then adjust, 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 adjust. Right? You know, behavior change is also dramatically more effective if you're doing it based on real time data, and you're doing it in real time as opposed to like issuing these impossible orders. Right? That people just don't know how to follow understand, et cetera, right? So, and we have, and we have, we have actual real empirical evidence of this. Um, so this is not just theoretical. <laughs> well, I think that the key is, I mean, the takeaway is high tech and high touch are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and, and the real power here is, is historically, we were basically practicing blind. Um, you're, you're clueless about what's going on with someone. Now by leveraging high tech, um, you have a sense, you have insights of, is this person moving? Are they active or not? Do they need some coaching? You know, what, what are we seeing in this data that may be actionable and allows us to then go, oh, I mean, we have a health system where they have a really powerful telehealth program but now they're going to implement our, our bio stickers and bio buttons. And when those generate an alert, then boom, that person will get a nice telehealth visit and let's talk about this. And let's, let's, you know, it's that teachable moment and technology is, is and, and again, let's not talk about technology. Let's talk about actionable information and actionable information gives us an opportunity to to deliver that that human interaction that can make a difference at the moment it can make a difference and be able to reserve that human interaction for 
for the person that needs it right now, because right now we're spending a lot of time checking on people who are perfectly fine and they're happy to chat with you. But you know what? We would have been better off spending a little bit more time on the person that needs it. So it's again, it's what we call exception management. And, and this is just great information to help us be so much smarter about how we apply our precious healthcare dollars and, and get way more benefit. And, and Todd and I are, are going to be spending a lot of time talking together, I'm sure. Absolutely. Jim, I really want to follow up with you. <laughs> Catch up. Same here. <laughs> I, I, I want to really just some closing remarks, but I want to add, just kind of think about it. Is, is there a scenario, Todd, where all of your members are wearing uh, the, the biointelligence stickers? Is that, is that where is, we're going? This is, what, is it? this is what I want to talk to Jim about. <laughs> but, you know, Dachin, when we were at... Uh, Health Evolution uh, Summit, uh, I guess it was two years ago because it got canceled last year. You know, that's, anyways, we'll talk about that. Sacha was like, oh yeah, we're just going to put these on everybody. Um, and we're doing that even for MA. So we'll talk about it. Awesome. Well, well, I want to I thank you both. I mean, imagine having a 4K movie. I mean, that's what we're doing is, you know, right now when somebody gets a clinic visit, they get a little snapshot. You see what's what they look like for 10 minutes if you're lucky. And if you can do that every six months, wow, that's that's great care. But imagine having a 4K movie of what this person's physiology looks like, what their movement pattern looks like, what their sleep looks like, what their gait looks like. And wow, we're seeing someone with a shuffle step that's an early indication of Parkinson's that we wouldn't have seen even in a 10 minute office visit. And it, two years from now, we'd figure out this person is starting to develop Parkinson's. But now we could see it so early that it was imperceptible to the human eye, but we can see it with these sensors. That's the kind of thing, and we can get them on early treatment because we know now that early treatment keeps Parkinson's from progressing. Totally. And all the com commensurate office visits and medication costs. So gosh, this is exciting for healthcare. It's, it's not about any one of us. And the cool thing is the collaboration that's happening now uh, between technology and providers and payers and the federal government. Plus one, amen. Thank you, Jim. I think that's a great closing, and certainly I can envision a you know Netflix library of of all of that data coming in. We maybe each have our own <laughs> Health Hub channel from from what what the uh, sensors are telling us. But in terms of wrapping up, I think we hired a lot of really great themes today across again data, technology, and then that that vertically vertically integrated tech stack that that's driving it all together. And Todd, I loved how you talked about owning the stack and how that's enabling you to deliver better care at the right place at the right time. And Jim, what I heard from you is the importance of continuous care management through technology, through exception management, through managing the right patients that we need to manage. And I really look forward to seeing what, what the two of you cook up together next, um, whether through advancing uh, future policy changes, your service in government and the public sector, as well as the private sector. I want to just uh, give you a moment in case I've left anything out um, before I think and turn it back over to Terry. That was a fantastic summary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you for moderating you. such a fun chat. Loved it. Thank Absolutely. you both. Jennifer, this is great. And uh, well, Todd and I will look back and th thank all of you for uh, uh, re uh, re reconnecting us. Uh, we'll do something good together as a result of this. Absolutely. And we'll report back. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Jennifer, thank you for leading a great session. Jim, Todd, I learned a lot. I've already taken a whole bunch of notes myself here. So thanks for sharing your thought leadership uh, at our conference. Outstanding.